All right, well, we'll get started, everyone. Thank you for joining with me today. We'll just let people come in as they do. And Sarah will keep an eye on our chat. So welcome to our Rise Up Year End Educational event. It's nice to see you. I'm Carly Benito. For those who don't know, I am the program manager for Rise Up. It's hard to believe that Rise Up is in its fourth year of the program and wrapping that up. So we've supported just over 100 amazing, innovative, women-led fund companies through the program within those four years. So today we're going to have clients, alumni, and mentors joining us from across the country. So also with me today, helping me with the event is Sarah Douglas. She's also from Innovation Glow. She's our Rise Venture Programs Coordinator. So thanks, Sarah, for your help today. Really appreciate it. So we would like to start our event by giving recognition to the land that Guelph is on. We recognize that everyone here might be on a different territory, so we invite and encourage you to give recognition to the land that you occupy today and every day. We are reminded that Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history, home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people today. So as a city, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work. Today, we like to acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Anishinaabek peoples on whose traditional territory we are meeting. So for your information, we are recording this event, the educational sessions portions, not the networking, and we'll share the session and the recordings along with the slides from the facilitators afterwards. To be more accessible, you have the option of turning on Zoom's closed captioning feature, which you can find at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. We will also be providing a French captioned version of the session after it's been recorded. So for those who are not familiar with Innovation Guelph, we work to support businesses start, grow, and thrive in Guelph, surrounding communities, and nationally through the program like Rise Up. So if you're looking for support or you know someone else is looking for support, please feel free to have them reach out to us. So I'd like to take a moment to thank our corporate sponsors, BDO, Ernst & Young, Reese Informatica and Invest in Guelph for, very, for their generosity and support in everything that we do at Innovation Guelph. We'd also like to give a special thank you to our Rise Up funder, the National Research Council of Canada Industrial Research Assistance Program or NRC IRAP. They enable us to provide this program to our companies and put on these types of events. So thank you to IRAP for your support with the event and with the program today. We have a very full agenda. We have lots happening today. So first we're going to hear from a prior Rise Up client. We've got two educational sessions, our networking in between there, and we will also have a break in the middle of the event. I would like to get started by introducing our first speaker, Abby Eli, uh, sorry, Abby Aaliyah, I Elia. Sorry, Abby. They're the co-CEO co of Execution of Clavis to start us off. So Abby and her company Clavis were a part of the Rise Up program last year, and I've invited her to share her a bit about her experience in the program and where she is today. So just to give you a bit of a background on Abby, they're a strategic leader with extensive experience in driving business transformation across the UK, Middle East, Africa, and North America. She was also listed as DMZ's Women of the Year at Ryerson University in 2022. A bit about Clavis. Clavis is a platform for designing and decorating virtual spaces with furnishing and materials that clients can actually buy. They also provide photorealistic renders that would normally require complex software and a big budget, all to ensure their users get 100% customer satisfaction from their clients. So Clavis is an all-in-one platform that replaces a number of separate tools typically bought and used by small business owners. Their community members are able to showcase their talents and find new clients, all with streamlined client engagement, contract management, marketing, accounting, and sourcing. So lots in there. So I would love to turn it over to Abby to share a little bit about her time in the program. Take it away, Abby. Thank you. I love that introduction. I should have recorded it so I can say that about myself. <laughs> Love it. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I think Carly was very great in explaining Clavis, but uh, I'll just summarize by saying um, I'm the co-founder and co-CEO for Clavis, and we've uh, we've just kind of we're trying to revolutionize um, the way interior design business is run 
help interior designers start their business earlier and generate more revenue. I think the typical concern with interior designers is, well, yeah, I've got a client now, but I don't know when I'm going to get the next one. Um, or I'm trying, I have a great idea in my head. I need to show my clients what I'm thinking. How do I visualize it for them? And so we provide that platform for them to be able to, you know, to succeed in, in, their, in their role as interior designers. Um, and I participated in the Rise Up program. Was it last year now? It feels like <laughs> last year. Uh, it was awesome. I've, uh, I had a survey on LinkedIn that asked oh, um, a couple of us to talk about accelerator programs or incubator programs that we may have participated in the past that we just loved and <laughs> rise up was the first that I came up with. And I have participated in a few. Um, I especially loved three things. I got a marketing person who understood my industry. It's Amazing having conversation with people who know what you're talking about and who understand where you're trying to get to. I also got a coach who helped me build my confidence in telling my story. As a founder, you need to be able to share your story so that people understand the reason behind what you do and why you do what you do. And, and, and the biggest thing was we had a pricing strategy uh, specialist who helped us go from point A to point B. And point A was when we first launched, we were able to see, we were for homeowners. So we were, when we were starting to figure out subscription and how to even charge interior designers to use our platform, it was great timing to be on Rise Up because we had someone who, that was their bread and butter. They, they, you know, they've done it for decades. And just having that person walk through things with us, go through documents after documents was priceless. We still have all three, we're applying all three right now. Pricing strategy is based on that. You know, my coach, I'm still following her on LinkedIn and just, you know, watching her be amazing. And more importantly, we still have our marketing specialist. <laughs> She's still helping us uh, just, just because they were so great. They were so helpful. They helped us grow. Since we've been on Rise Up, we've won even more awards. I'm in LA right now. Uh, as part of a trade mission to sell to the California market. We all know that's a big market right there. We joined the Google for Startups um, Accelerator as well. So we, we've gone, I would say we've gone way further than we would have gone if we, we didn't participate in the Rise Up program. It just helped us move faster, make decisions better, and put our story out there, which is, which is very important. For the first startup, for a business, really. And fantastic summary. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I, and congratulations to everyone here. It's it's. I think you've done the right thing, and I cannot wait to hear about your businesses and and see you thrive. That was a great summary, Abby. It was all you, and so nice to hear about all of the awards that you've won and your business continuing to grow. We've got a couple minutes if anyone's got any questions about Abby, about where their business is or their time in the program, feel free to ask. I did have a question, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> also, thanks for joining us from LA. Very jealous. I'm sure the weather is amazing <laughs> there. <laughs> it said it's going to rain tomorrow, so I need to leave before it rains. <laughs> oh my goodness. I just wanted to ask if you could kind of give a piece of advice for what's next. So a lot of the people in the program right now are wrapping up their projects. They might be ending their relationships with their coach because time is kind of wrapping up. What would you suggest as a next step for them? Any pieces of advice? Okay, hey, great question. Um, we spent time after we completed the program. I think we really spent time going back over what we learned and how we were going to execute that over the next 60, 90, and 120 days. And we made it very short because we wanted to be able to immediately um, set metrics and see the result of you know the metrics that we set. Um, so I would say the first thing is, I don't know some of the engagements that people have had. The first thing is, you know, if you've had marketing consultation, execute what was recommended and track and monitor and see if it's working. And if it's not, make changes. It's, it, that's, that's the fastest way to see results, right? And um, 
with our coach, one of the some of the things that she recommended were books. Like she said, read some books, learn about people. And so I spent time, at, which was difficult at, as a founder, you're doing a lot of things, but I spent time reading about my space, about people that I've done it before and about the SaaS space, the B2B space. It's a new word for me. What does that look like? How would I thrive in there? What should I be looking out for? Um, those two big things were important for us. And I also put myself out there more. I participated more in events. I reached out to people to share our story. I actually reached out to the media agency to say, we did this. Here's why we're great. Here's why you, why you need to talk about us. And we did. So I think just put yourself out there more. You have enough to, to be great. So people need to know that. People need to hear it. Because if, if you don't tell people, people would not ask you. That was some fantastic thoughts and fantastic advice. You need to ring your own bell and share your great news and the work that you're That's doing. Awesome. That's perfect. Thanks so much, Abby. Really appreciate you taking us through that. So again, great to see where you've been and excited to see where you're going to go next. Really appreciate you joining us today and sharing a couple words. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. So moving on to our first session of the day. So when we polled clients to figure out what events we were going to, what educational sessions we were going to have, we heard some strong feedback that we want marketing and we want sales. So we took that into account and put together some really fantastic presentations for you today. So for our first session, it is going to be on marketing strategy. And it is my pleasure to introduce our facilitator, Shannon Kamat, to take us through her session on marketing. So Shannon's skills and experience in marketing strategy, sales, and product development have helped both startups and scale-ups launch and scale their products in the marketplace. Her work for global brands like Procter & Gamble, Pfizer, and the Toronto 2015 Pan Am and Para Pan Am Games built the foundation for her startup marketing consulting and mentoring for accelerators and incub incubation pro programs across Canada currently working as a practitioner chief marketing officer for startups and running her marketing agency, Engagement Marketing, Shannon leads marketing teams to grow her clients' revenue. Throughout her presentation today, Shannon will have dedicated time to answer any questions from the audience. So we ask that you please refrain in asking questions until then, and we'll let you know when those times are. So Shannon, the floor is yours if you'd like to share your slides. Great, thank you for that introduction, Carly. Um, I am going to get my slides. There we go. So I hope everyone's doing well today. It, uh, it seems like there's congratulations in order for everyone going through the program. Woohoo! Now, I couldn't help myself, but I am a big Office fan. So I did have to start with this slide because I love the office and <laughs> I think you guys all need to celebrate. Uh, part of what I'm going to talk to you today is um, about budgeting, ROI, um, just foundational marketing elements that are really important to nail before you even get into planning. Um, so I'm starting off with once you've created your marketing strategy, which is a task in itself, uh, now you need to turn that into a budget. And budgeting is not the most fun thing, I would say, uh, at least for most people, but it's necessary. And um, it's a good idea to really understand the market, um, the market specifically that your business is in, and then also just trends in the marketplace. So I'll be going through a few of those things in my presentation. So starting off, um, looking at 2022, going into 2023, uh, everyone's talking about the looming recession and interest rates and all of that. Uh, and what does that mean for your marketing spend? Um, well, apparently, marketing spend is going up um, because 
it's more competition. Uh, there's, you know, people that are, are, you know, trying to decide if they're going to spend the money and you have to convince them that they do. So generally speaking, companies spend between 6.5 to 17%, which is a huge range. Um, and I'm going to get into a little more detail about how this relates to the economic sector that you're in, um, the industry that you're in, whether you're B2C, B2B. Uh, so starting off pretty wide range, but we're going to narrow that down as I go. So, so four of the different elements that will affect your marketing budget is your company size, your economic sector, the industry that you're in, and your stage of growth. So, you know, those things will uh, affect your marketing your budget, uh, maybe in a big way, maybe in a small way. It really depends where you're at uh, in in your stage of growth and um, what your industry is. So looking at it by industry, <clears throat> I pulled some stats uh, in 2022, just so they were relevant. Now, keep in mind that this is US stats, because it's very hard to get Canadian ones. Um, but just as a kind of a baseline uh, estimate. These types of industries spend different amounts of money on marketing. <clears throat> Energy sector clearly being the lowest to healthcare, service and consulting, um, and technology being on the higher end. So you can niche that down a little bit more as well. But overall, these are some of the um, percentages of overall revenue that people are spending on a marketing budget. Now, to break that down, just to, you know, think about on a monthly basis, how much is that for a small business? Um, in 2022, the average um, spend was between 5 to 15K, uh, for a small business. And that's 50% of these participants um, in this study said that they would spend this amount of money on their marketing. Now, less than 30% said less than 5K. And then people spending over 15K was about just over 16%. So the majority is between 5 to 15. But again, these other elements of your industry, your where you're at in your startup journey, uh, all of these things, you know, will will um, affect where you're spending your money and how you're allocating your budget. So something that you have to think about before you start even working on your marketing budget is understanding what your goals are for that budget because you don't want to waste that precious money as a startup. A lot of times, you know, you're bootstrapped, maybe you have a bit of investment, your series A, you're trying to get more investment, series B. So those investors are really looking at you being smart with your money, spending it on things that are going to produce an ROI. And you have to tie those different elements of your marketing budget to an outcome. So this is what I'm going to get into in a little bit more detail. So this is Forrest Gump. It's about working backwards from your marketing objectives and then look at your goal and then see where you're going to go from there. I love my gifts. Sorry about that. <laughs> Now, um, just in general, I was talking to Carly, we're integrating some polls into this webinar. Um, how much would your company be willing to invest in marketing uh, just as a percentage? And if you don't feel comfortable answering, you don't have to.
Okay. So somewhere between three to 10% is, seems to be majority. Okay. Yeah, so again, this is, you know, depends where you're at in your startup journey uh, and also your uh, your sector that you are in. But yeah, it's um, the ones that are closer to like the 15 to 17% range. A lot of times that's tech. Um, maybe they're a little further along. They've reached... Um, product market fit, they're really scaling, um, trying to, you know, get to 100 million in revenue, or they're, you know, they're, they're trying to scale fast. So this is pretty typical, um, especially closer to the five to 10% range. So thank you for sharing that. Um, now, um, in 2023, I looked at a poll just to see what the trends were, because it was interesting to me that things changed a lot during the pandemic and people were increasing mar marketing budgets in some areas. They were decreasing in others. They were investing maybe more in e-commerce. They were, you know, they're, everyone was pivoting. So now going into 2023, um, how you know, how are people feeling? What are they going to be spending their money on? And the majority of the people in this survey were saying that they were expecting to actually spend more in 2023 on their budget, which is interesting. Um, and when we broke it down by um, different marketing activity, social media seemed to be uh, the biggest thing that people were spending their money on. Uh, followed by a website with blogs, uh, search engine optimization, that's a part of their strategy, uh, email marketing, and then content marketing, which is interesting because content marketing kind of encompasses a lot of those things. Um, but most of the time, you'll bundle your social media with your email marketing, with your blog and your SEO, and it kind of will work together. <clears throat> but um, some of the other items on this list are uh, search ads, influencer marketing, um, social media DMs I thought was interesting because that seems to be an emerging type of um, outreach that you can do depending on what social media channels you're using. <clears throat> And then also virtual events, webinars, and in-person conferences. So this is kind of, it's a bit of a breakdown of a marketing budget. You can include lots of other things, um, but I'm going to get into a lot more detail on budgets, which is super exciting, but very necessary. Um, and we can look at where all these buckets come in to play. So why do you need a detailed marketing budget? Now, I don't know what the status is with the people on this call, but um, in many cases, the clients that I work with are using a spreadsheet. So because of that, um, I'm going to try and take you from this to this using a spreadsheet that actually will help you track month to month, um, year over year in different buckets to know what's working, what's not, what you need to take out, what you need to leave in. Um, and this will help you prioritize. Um, we're gonna get into calculating your ROI and looking at whether we wanna take things out of that budget or keep things in. So <clears throat> some of the things included, which I talked about a little bit earlier, are social media marketing, advertising, SEO, website, and so forth. So here is an example. Now, um, 
has it, maybe someone can raise their hand. Who is using spreadsheets for their budgeting? Or do most of you do this or are you kind of beyond that and you're, you know, you're using different programs, online programs, you have an accountant that handles all of that, or are you kind of in the midst of it and as a founder still doing that? So raise, okay, so two people raise their hand, they're, they're using spreadsheets, okay. So only two people are using spreadsheets, that's it? Wow. Okay. So you're way further along than I thought. <laughs> um, well, I guess going through, I won't go too deep into this. Um, then if, if people are kind of beyond this point, but I guess the takeaway from looking at an in-depth marketing budget is that you have your buckets of um, different marketing activities. In this case, I have product marketing, content, paid advertising, public relations, where, you know, a lot of times in smaller companies, we bucket public relations and communications activities into a marketing budget. So we've included that. Uh, branding and creative events and other. So to break that down even further, um, this is under the content section. So this is uh, something that I'll be sharing with the group uh, as a template that you can download and you can customize it to your own needs. Um, but in the content section, we broke it down to software, publishing tools, services that you're using, uh, freelancers like writers, designers, developers for your content. Uh, so all these things are in your marketing budget. And some people include these things some people don't, but it, it all depends on how you set it up with your accountant. Um, but this is a great start. Uh, or if you're looking to scale a bit more than just using a basic budget, this will help you track things better. And I'll be sharing this at the end and you'll have, um, you'll have access to a Trello board that... Uh, will hopefully provide some good insight. So now we're gonna get into our breakout session. And um, I don't know, Carly, do you wanna kick it off? Sure, so I'm going to have Sarah help me put folks into a breakout room. So we're going to go into a breakout room for 10 minutes and Shannon would like folks to discuss how are you measuring your marketing? ROI. So give Sarah a little bit of time to put those rooms together. And I'll be jumping in periodically. Uh, if you guys are having some conversations and you have questions, then I'm happy to be a fly on the wall and answer in the chat. Um, if, you know, you're not sure what I mean by calculating mar marketing ROI, or if uh, you've had issues with this in the past, then I'm happy to help. Perfect, so people should be seeing an option to join a breakout room, so you can click accept. If you have any issues with that, just send us a note and we'll make sure we get you into a room. Hi. All right, we're just all popping back in from our breakout rooms. Yep, I think we're all here, Shannon. Great. Um, so yeah, we were getting into some good conversation and uh, I wish I could have gone on to more people's breakouts. Uh, it was starting to get really interesting and then I was telling stories and then, you know, that takes a long time. <laughs> but um, I might just start with recapping um, a story that I was sharing with the first group. Uh, and that is uh, when I first started my business, um, being a marketing professional and working in this industry for uh, now over 20 plus years, um, I was at agencies and at brands as well. 
I was so excited when starting my business as an entrepreneur and as a founder uh, that I wanted to market. I thought I could help everyone. I thought I could market to everyone um, and they would be excited to work with me because you know, I've been doing it for a long time and I had a lot of contacts in the industry. But what I soon realized uh, after putting a marketing budget together, spending money on marketing and then seeing how that marketing performed, um, it, the results weren't great. Like they were pretty bad, actually, because I when you market to everyone, you market to no one which I tell my clients not to do. But of course, I didn't listen to my own advice. And I marketed to such a broad audience that it didn't resonate with my target audience. Like they, they didn't see that I was, um, you know, a part of their ecosystem and that I was, I, you know, understood the things that they understood. But once I figured that out quickly, um, because as a founder, you have to scale quickly and figure things out in real time. Uh, I changed that strategy and then started marketing towards um, uh, tech and software, which was my niche. I'd worked in product development previously. Um, so I could talk the tech. I knew the language. I demystified it for a lot of my clients. Um so once I did that and I kind of got into that group and then marketed to them, like the results just went crazy. Like the, it was, it was fantastic. So that would be my one piece of advice when you are putting a marketing budget together and you're looking at how that's performing and seeing what the results are, uh, you got to calculate that in real time, see what's going on, pivot quickly, and just keep fine tuning it until you get those results that you're looking for. So that that would be my piece of advice. Um, and I'm going to get into a little bit more on the ROI side. I am with the group that I was speaking with. Um, I was talking about the ROI that um, we need to calculate and I'm going to do a deep dive into that. So are you ready? <laughs> Cause this is, this is a big spreadsheet. All right. <clears throat> so move this over here. Now <clears throat> I tried to make this as, um, basic as possible, but also, as um, informative as possible so that it would appeal to your group because I know you're all at different stages. Um, so I have a, a lot of different terms in here. Some of you may be very familiar, some of you may not. Um, the first one is about uh, lead conversions. So <clears throat> I structured this on and this is the, the case study. So think about your company that gets most of your leads through your website because someone has filled out a form. Uh, they have requested a, um, a demo or a consultation with your company. Um, or maybe you have a 1-800 number and they're calling to book an appointment. So these are the two ways, and I'm making this super simple because I know this isn't the case for all of you. And some of you are in e-commerce and some of you are doing other things, which is not this, um, but just work with me. So we have these two different ways that we're tracking leads. The total leads that we've gotten from this program. So let's say it's ran for a week. Uh, and we see that, okay, 30 leads have come in. So we're tracking 30 leads. They've booked demos or appointments. And then out of those leads, we've sold 20 products or services, whatever the case may be. Now, <clears throat> the average product sales price is $200. 
So the total sales, so the 20 times 200 is $4,000. So you have made $4,000 from this marketing activity. So maybe you did a campaign online. It was a Facebook campaign or a Google ads campaign. And you spent your marketing budget was $1,500. So sales are 4,000. Marketing budget is 1,500. Now, your uh, cost per acquisition is $75. So that's your marketing spend divided by your number of new customers. So $75. Your customer lifetime value, this changes with every type of business, industry, whatnot. If you are maybe a SaaS company um, or you have uh, customers that will stay with you for long periods of time, then maybe you look at a four-year period because you've seen that your average customer lifetime value is four years. So you times that $200 sale to $800 because that's how much they'll spend with you over that four years. Am I losing anyone? Like are people understanding? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so then we get into the sales lead conversion rate. So when I, when I talk about sales to lead conversion, that is how many leads came in from this advertising activity? And then how many sales did you get out of it? So number of sales, 20, number of leads, 30. So it was a 67% conversion rate, which is very high, which is like not normal. <laughs> Most conversion rates are a lot lower than that. So just take the number as you would. Um, I would say it would be you know, usually, I don't know, somewhere in the, in the line of like 5%. So 67% is a lot. Um, now, the ROI, which is what we're all talking about here, is the total sales divided by the marketing spend. So for every dollar we spent, we made $3 in this case. So I don't, I don't know if you want me to get into more detail, just let me know after this, people can chime in. But um, at the end of the day, you know, for every dollar made $3. Uh, total lifetime customer value, if your customer lifetime value is $800, so $200 times four years, times 20 sales, it's $16,000. So these are all things that are great to calculate because it's eye-opening. When you get into this kind of detail, you'll see, okay, so maybe, maybe I didn't make a lot of sales, but then the customers that I got were really high value customers and they're going to be with us for years and years. Therefore, their lifetime value is a lot more. And then the campaign, maybe it is more successful because those customers will stick around. So just things to think about. Uh, and then also with the ROI, um, let's say we take into consideration that lifetime customer value. Well, now that's gone up to $11 over four years. So if we look at over the four year period, these people are gonna stick with us. That's $11. So it, it, you know, you can play around with the numbers and think about what your market is and typically what your customer lifetime value is. But these are just some calculations that you can make. And I, I'll share a calculator that I use for campaigns. Um, but this is, and if you want, you can take a screenshot of this, uh, so you can look at it later and, and maybe play around with some of the numbers, but, um, yeah, this, this kind of breaks it down. I hope this is helpful to you and it, it's not 
too basic uh, or too complicated, but if anyone has questions at this time, please let me know. And if not, I'll get into more ROI type stuff. Shannon, I'll just chime yeah. in because we did have sure. some questions that were in the chat yeah. a little while ago. So someone had asked, uh, should your marketing budget include marketing employee salaries? And what about outsourced marketing help? For example, someone who creates blog content, social media posts, et cetera. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so all your marketing activities and um, so you have your hard costs and then you have your you know, internal costs. So that, that should all be within your marketing budget, freelancers, all that. I'll also just add, if other folks had questions, feel free to raise your Zoom hand or unmute yourself and ask. So perfect. So Sarah's going to help me out with that. Hi, Kevin. Kevin. A question from Kevin. Yep. Yeah, I got a question. So, um, so one of the biggest challenges that I find with companies is how do you distinguish um, you know, the difference between, let's say, you know, you can do an email marketing campaign, but you, you have to have technology kind of in the back end that actually allows you to measure some of this data that you have. But then you get into things like social media posts or something like that, right? And you might have a consistent stream of that. How do you measure ROI sometimes on something that feels like an indirect type of scenario? I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I see with companies. It is a big challenge because uh, it's a lot easier if you're doing paid advertising, like if you're doing a social media campaign that you're paying for and you have an ad and you know how much time and effort put like was put into that ad uh, and, you know, what the cost was. Um, it's a lot easier of an ROI um, if you have multiple factors going on for a campaign um a lot of times like if you're if you have systems in place like you have your like say you're doing marketing automation or um you have uh, email marketing that you're doing uh, as well as just organic posts that you're you know doing for ongoing marketing um it's it's kind of hard to track that from a like say you're doing a specific campaign for something um it's hard to track all that together but overall if you're tracking what you're spending on marketing um and you're and you're looking at what the results of that marketing is and you should always be trying especially with social media to get people to your email list or to somehow um, take that relationship so that it's a closer connection and you have something from them. So you email is, is usually the, the main thing that we try and work on um, because we like typically, if you're looking at a funnel, it's potato lasagna and my very binge worthy. <laughs> I think your mic is. <laughs> um, so if you think about your email marketing, um, your social media marketing, um, say you're doing YouTube videos, you're doing all these things and they're at the top, they should be going towards building either a list uh, and or um, also like for a specific campaign, like you're turning that into sales. So there are, you know, two different types of elements. I don't know if I answered that question well enough for you, but basically it's, yeah. it's tough. It's really tough to, to measure those outside factors that aren't campaign based. Um, but you know, if you take an average of how much you're spending on marketing and then, you know, on a month to month basis, what your revenue is, then, you know, that can be your overall ROI. Right. Well, I think what I work with companies sometimes on is 
taking a look at your overall financials, right? Because sometimes you get an overall sense of what you do spend on marketing, or you do get what you do spend on marketing versus, you know, kind of certain part. And then it's looking at things like measurables. If you measure the number of leads that came in or inquiries, the number of followers you have on platforms or what have you, and things like that. And then you just capture a whole bunch of metrics. So I tend to kind of go like bigger picture, understanding like a month or a year overall. And then I try to take it sometimes granularly back, you know, just being kind of like, okay, well, here's this campaign. How did we do? You know, and sometimes the challenge with campaigns is there's a there's a grandfather effect or an evergreen effect that kind of comes into effect that, you know, you don't get a lead until like a a year down the road or something, you know. So yeah, I mean it depends if it's B2B, B2C, like if it's a B2B and it's a long sales cycle, then you know, sometimes yeah. that won't show up right away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I was just curious, but uh yeah, no. Looks good when you can get some measurables, right? That's the main thing you're trying to find here. So yeah. And, you know, I, I hope these different terms resonate with people, just the, you know, like the ROI, how do you calculate it? Generally speaking, I know it's not always a perfect science, um, but just becoming more familiar with, you know, sales to lead conversion rates, customer lifetime value, cost per acquisition, um, you know, like what is a lead I'm going to get into a little um, getting into a little more granular stuff. So I've um, provided a link to this calculator, which is great through HubSpot um, that anyone can access. It's a, it's a marketing ROI calculator that some of my clients uh, will use and will use for campaigns. Uh, now, nothing is an exact science. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of take this with a grain of salt and really understand sometimes like what's your, uh, you know, CPC or like what's, how much are you willing to spend? And anyway, once you get into that, uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. Uh, but this is a very basic uh, marketing calculation to calculate ROI, um, and some of which I just went over. Um, now, when you go into tracking and measuring marketing performance, this is where we get into things like tracking uh, your brand awareness, um, and then also awareness of non-branded keywords. That's more of an SEO and a PPC type of play, but uh, it's something within your Google Analytics of your website you want to track. Uh, conversions, um, so are people engaging in your content? Are they watching a video, downloading um, a PDF? You know, are they reading all the way to the bottom of your page? things like that. And then also um, your leads. So, you know, seeing are your leads going up or down throughout the month? What are the marketing activities that you're doing? And how did those activities lead to uh, some of these sales conversions? So broken it down into these different metrics that you can track. And again, um, I'm happy to talk to you more one-on-one -on -one about this. Um, and if you wanna take a screen capture, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, so under brand awareness, <clears throat> that's where we look at things like reach, uh, which is more usually ad focused, but it can also be a social media metric, um, like a hashtag that you're tracking, um, or if you're doing social media monitoring, um, there's certain terms that you could be monitoring uh, and seeing what your brand awareness is like. The impressions of a branded ad is also, also something that you can track. Um, and then also within 
uh, search and optimization, uh, if you are number one for your branded keyword uh, in search, you want to know how much traffic that's bringing in, what is the awareness like. Um, so just getting an understanding of how widespread your brand awareness is. Uh, and then when you get into non-branded awareness uh, and conversion metrics, it's things like visits, uh, sessions, users, and then you can use the source medium within Google Analytics to break that down. Um, and when you break it down, you can break it down by, um, is it through organic Google search? Uh, is it through a Google ad? Is it uh, from an email campaign? Is your traffic through um, an affiliate where that you're tracking? There's all sorts of different sources of traffic that can come into your website. And the more you're able to understand performance based on those metrics, then the easier it'll be for you to see if your marketing efforts are actually working. Um, so things like events and goals. Um, events are the biggest thing. When I work with clients, we track, um, you know, are people clicking on calls to action? Are they watching a video? Are they doing what we intended them to do once they read a landing page? Uh, so those types of things on your website are great to track when you're doing a campaign or even um, if you're writing blog posts and creating web content. Uh, and then with conversion rates, that's... Um, you know, how many people are taking action when they get to your site. So that's something that you want to calculate as well. Does anyone have any questions so far? This is all very like website based um, with a little bit of social media. Um, so I know people use other forms of marketing as well, but this is kind of basic website stuff. All right, so I'll get more into um, when we talk about leads, cost per lead, lead close rate, uh, those are kind of outside of what your marketing activities are. <clears throat> and you could use something like a HubSpot or Salesforce to track that. Um, maybe you're using a spreadsheet. Whatever the case may be, is understanding how many leads you're bringing in per month, per year, uh, per quarter. That's extremely important. And then what the cost per lead is. Um, so kind of breaking it down based on what I talked about earlier with that spreadsheet. And then what is your lead to close rate? So if you have so many leads in the pipeline and I'm sure um, your sales presentation will probably get into this maybe a little bit. Um, what is that lead to close rate? So how many leads came in? And then what is the percentage of those that turned into sales? Uh, the other things that we talk about uh, as part of the performance um, tracking is return on ad spend. So knowing whether your ad was effective and if the amount of money that you paid was, you know, positive or negative um, and did that in turn create revenue or did you basically spend what you earned, which is not somewhere you want to be. Um, customer lifetime value, we talked about that a little bit. And then at the bottom here, we have, I think it's cost per lead, I'm actually, ah, cost per acquisition. So how much did it cost to acquire that lead? Which is something that I talked about in the spreadsheet. So um, next steps, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd be happy to 
talk about things that you should be tracking on your website and campaigns and that type of thing. Does anyone have a question about that? Just before then, Shannon, I'm wondering if we can go back to, there's two questions in the chat. Just want to make sure, sure. that they're uh, answered. So Sarah, can you uh, share what those questions were? For sure. So we had a question from Tina who asks, do you consider your branding, oh, sorry, just trying to get back, branding as part of your marketing spending? I do, yes. And, and that's because I work with fairly small businesses uh, with larger um, corporations and brands. Sometimes they will separate that, but I usually bundle it with marketing. Great. And then we had a question from Jennifer again, who asks what percentage should go to advertising versus marketing? Sometimes those are lumped together. Yeah, I usually lump those together. So um, advertising spend, you know, depend depending on if you're putting it into product marketing and you have your different products separated and you have um, a spend, like say you're doing Facebook marketing or Google ads or, or you know, a media buy, um, you know, you've got your creative, you've got your... Um, copy, all those things that go into creating the ad. Um, I would focus a lot on that um, and maybe not as much on the actual spend. Now, I know that it is not maybe a popular belief with marketers that, you know, we need to maximize our ad budget and put as much money into our ad campaign. But if you're creative, sucks, then your campaign will not give you an ROI. <laughs> so that creative is, has better be pretty compelling um, to get your audience's attention. So uh, once you perfect the creative, then, you know, you go out and you spend the money. And if you're seeing value from that, uh, from your spend, then you can increase your budget and then you have more of a justification to increase it because you're seeing results. So, you know, I'm always a believer on creative first, um, understanding your audience, who you're targeting, nailing your messaging, um, and, you know, putting as much time and effort into that. And then, you know, seeing how much you have for uh, your ad budget. Because you can always increase your your ad budget if you're seeing an ROI. Great, and then we have a question from Joanne and Courtney. If you want to unmute, thank you. Hi, Shannon. Hi. Um, question about earlier in the slides, you mentioned that in the statistics that companies are spending more on social media than on their website. And Joanne and I are talking about we were quite surprised that the website was second. Mm -hmm. um, we're wondering if you could explain that a little bit. Um, as to why to spend more on the social media or why companies are pushing that more than because the website development does cost more. So we're yeah. kind of surprised. Yeah, I was actually surprised too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, you know, I think your website, and again, this goes back to bringing the customer into your ecosystem. And this is the, the main catalyst for, posting on social media. So you're trying to get them back to your branded assets, to your list um, so that they, you know, are a true um, loyal fan. Uh, and social media, I think because uh, there are a lot more things that you can do on social media. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is like, there's the, uh, e-commerce part to it now, um, which didn't exist a couple of years ago on Instagram and Facebook, um, on Pinterest, where you can actually sell on those platforms. So that might be bundled in with the social media piece. Um, and then also, you know, advertising uh, on social media, boosting posts, um, because now it is more expensive 
to like the engagement that once was four years ago or however long on Facebook is not what it was like you could in the past you could post from your business account your audience would see that post and you would get a good ROI from it now you really have to pay um, to get that engagement on Facebook specifically not as much on Instagram but Instagram is slowly moving towards that direction where you're having to really um, pay to get any kind of visibility um same with linkedin same with pinterest a little bit more as well uh so all of the social platforms are um incentivizing people to pay uh to post and i think that's maybe why people are putting more money into it uh because it's going into ad spend um and then frequency is also a big um, indicator, especially on Instagram for um, increased engagement. So if you're not posting frequently, uh, this is the same thing on YouTube, um, you aren't going to be seen as much. So it's almost like, you know, you have to keep doing that to maintain your impression share and um, it gets expensive. Now, is there an ROI to that? It really depends on your industry, uh, B2C, B2B, um, if you're a manufacturer, if you're uh, you know, de developing an app, if you're a retailer, all those things factor in you know, how much time you should be spending on social media uh, posting and um, how much of your budget should go there. So that, don't get too caught up with that chart because that's a very wide range. Yeah. So my advice to you is like, really think about your specific industry and whether that, um, whether you need to spend that much time on social media or dedicate that much of a budget to it. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Shannon. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really long winded answer. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. No, I really helped clear it up. Okay. Great. And then we just have two other questions here. Allison's asking, are there any of these features on LinkedIn? Uh, what, sorry, what features are you referring to specifically? This was asked at 1.07 PM. So I'm wondering if it has anything to do with the performance metrics. Sorry, I'm not sure. Allison, if you had any clarification there. Oh, performance metrics. Yes. Okay. Um, Yes. So LinkedIn is just like any other social media platform. Um, you'll be able to see what your metrics are um, like within Google Analytics to see if people are coming from LinkedIn to your website. Uh, and then also you can see what your metrics are. Um, if you have a business account, then you can see, um, you know, how, what kind of engagement you're getting on your posts and how many followers you have. Um, you can also use outside tools to track a lot of those um, different platforms together. Uh, so things like Hootsuite. Um, and then I have a list that I'll be sharing as part of this Trello board. I have um, a tool stack uh, recommendations, persona, templates, um, the budget template, a whole bunch of things that hopefully will be of use to you guys. Um, and it may be more use to some than others, depending on what stage you're at. But um, yeah, definitely LinkedIn, you can see all of those metrics. Great, thanks. And then just the last question from the chat here from Kara. Uh, can you speak a bit about one, the ways to repurpose content and two, ways to make content evergreen? Yes. Uh, so I do this a lot with my clients um, because we do a lot of content marketing together. Um, because when startups, the, the startups that I work with, especially in the tech sector, uh, if they're in a, a certain niche, um, they are typically 
writing a lot about the solutions to problems um, for their customer base. Uh, so a lot of that can come from questions from their support team, um, which we'll then repurpose into a blog post. And if it's not timely, like if it if if it's not something that is equated to a certain you know year or time period, and it still will stand the test of time, then that will be evergreen content. And that evergreen content is great for search engine optimization, because if you are one of the first that was um, talking about a certain you know, uh, keyword phrase that no one else was talking about, and then all of a sudden people started talking about it, um, and you're top of search for that term and you know it's 10 years later and you're still top of search and you're updating that with more content um that's extremely an effective strategy to get leads and um and have people and brand exposure Great. So I think that's all of our questions that we had in the chat for now. If anybody else has any questions that you'd like to raise your hand or we can move on to the next portion. Okay. So I'll just... Um, so just to close out, how to make the most of your marketing investment, uh, understanding your customer journey, extremely important. Hiring a marketing agency or freelancers when needed. Uh, you may not need to. Maybe you have an in-house team or maybe the founder has a deep expertise in marketing. Um, so, you know, you don't need to hire people from outside, which is fine. Uh, but a lot of times um, with startups, it's a hybrid of both in-house and um, freelancers or marketing agency. Um, invest in content repurposing. So we just talked about that. That's very timely. Uh, I, I invest quite a bit in going back to blog posts and things that um, I know I can add to with more information that will be relevant to that target audience. Um, and therefore, you know, it helps with search engine optimization. Um, and it also makes you an authority in that field. So that's important. Um, Deprioritize underperforming channels. Now, I didn't get into this too much uh, when we we're talking about marketing performance, but if your audience isn't on a platform, like say you're a manufacturer, uh, and you want to be on every single platform, well, you probably don't want to be on Pinterest, like, you know, depending on what you're manufacturing. <laughs> um, you, you know, might not want to be on Instagram. Maybe it's more B2B, so it's it's a LinkedIn strategy. But if you can focus on at least one social media platform that you are dominating, then putting that energy into that one platform to um, have as much of a presence as possible. And then if you do want to be on other platforms, then maybe you spend less time on those, but you pick one that you think your audience is going to be most active on, uh, at least at the beginning, because it, when you're with limited budgets and that kind of thing, you don't want to be spreading yourself too thin. As you grow, then you can obviously have a team that will be posting for you and and keeping up with all of that. Um, and then lastly, tweaking your mar marketing strategy based on performance. So like those metrics that I talked about earlier, uh, keeping track of the metrics, whether you're using HubSpot or Salesforce or, you know, um, Pipedrive, or there's a lot of different platforms that you can use to measure that. Um, but you want to keep on top of performance because if all of a sudden you see that numbers are dropping, maybe leads aren't converting, 
it could be a messaging problem. Uh, maybe you're not using the right messaging that is resonating with that target audience. Um, maybe you're not getting their attention. There's a lot of different things. And until you test it and tweak it, you won't know. So make sure to continually tweak. And that's it. So um, I believe Carly is going to be sharing this um, PowerPoint presentation with you. I have a link to the Trello board, uh, as well as the, the ROI calculator. And um, I think someone was asking about funding opportunities for marketing. So I included a couple of uh, links there where you can look for um, there's government funding and then there's a, um, a service called uh, Ripen, which is government funded, <clears throat> at least it was last year. And uh, you can find students um, if you need uh, help with your marketing and your budget is really tight, then they're also a great service. And that's it. Does anyone have any other questions on ROI or budgets or performance or anything like that? Um, can you throw those links in the chat, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, can I do that? I can do it for you, Shannon. We've got your PowerPoint okay. presentation here. Perfect, okay, great. No problem, so thank just you. give me a second, folks. So I'll also just ask, um, because it is a popular question, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, it's like, are there affordable marketing options out there when cash flow is an issue? So thanks for sharing those grant links, for example, but your thoughts on that, Shannon? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of co-op programs out there, um, especially with universities like the University of Guelph. Um, but most of the universities have a co-op program. Um, I know with tech, uh, I think University of Waterloo has a lot of, um, you know, tech focused students that come out of there. Um, on the marketing side, you know, I've used university students on the past. I've used Ripen, which is actually, I think they pull from across Canada in college and university. Um, you can you can see if it's like an MBA program that you want to target uh, because some of the MBA programs also do co-op. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of options when it comes to hiring like a junior person. Um, so yeah, I would just say that you might want to, you, if you are hiring someone junior, you also want to maybe book cons like a marketing consultant, uh, to give that person some strategic advice so they can have a, you know, a starting point. Perfect. And Cara commented, you know, ripens worldwide. You can get people from anywhere. So being able to pull from talent across the world, very helpful. Right. Yeah. So appreciate your comment around looking at what is performing and what are the most useful social media platforms for your business. So I think another way just to be affordable, social media for the most part being free, just focusing your time on those platforms that are going to get your best ROI, right? <laughs> Especially if you're doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. Because when you're first starting and funds are tight and you're not wanting to, you know, hire too many people, then a lot of these things you're having as a founder, you might be having to do it yourself. Um, so that's when you really need to focus and pick a platform. Perfect. Thanks, Shannon. So just pause for another moment just to see if there's any other questions people want to put in the chat or raise your hand and ask away. I have a question. Thanks, Harry. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you said that once you have your marketing strategy set, this is what we are going to do. <laughs> but that uh, once you have your marketing strategy set is a big task on its own. So um, what what 
do you have any words of wisdom uh, regarding to that? And also, what is the role of a consultant in uh, in that process of coming up with the marketing strategy for a startup? Mm -hmm. So rewinding to that first slide, uh, the marketing strategy, you, you do need to, I probably should have prefaced this, but you do need to have a bit of an idea of what your budget is, like a general kind of ballpark idea. Um, and then you can look at, okay, well, what are the tactics? What are the, whatever my, first of all, what are my goals? Um, and you can use a marketing consultant to work with you on figuring out what those goals are um, for your industry. What are the benchmarks? Um, you know, what, what should you be focusing on first? Uh, a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day rollout. Um, you know, what are the most important things to focus on during those time periods? Uh, and a marketing consultant can help with that. Um, and then, you know, once you come up with that, um, overall strategy, and when I say strategy, I'm going to use that term loosely because, it's more of, you know, what are your goals um, as part of that strategy? So knowing the goals first will really help inform the bigger strategy and then the budget. So figuring out those goals is important. And, you know, you can use a marketing consultant, you can use someone at University of Guelph, the Rise Up, Pro, like, you know, I think there's a lot of resources there that can help with that. Um, but then turning that into an actionable plan. Um, when you work with someone like a strategist, they can help with that. And then you use a more junior person to do the execution, which will cut down on costs. Thank you. Does Does that resonate with my other marketing consultant? that I, I, I see there. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Any other questions people had for Shannon? All right, perfect. Well, I'd like to thank you, Shannon, for taking us through your educational session. A lot of great points there. I particularly thought it was interesting, similar to the other participant about people's spend on social media compared to their website. Always nice to have kind of the new trends and what's up and coming. So thank you again for your presentation. And I've popped those links in the chat. And also as you've shared, those resources will all be shared with you after our presentation ends. So thank you, Shannon, really appreciate your time. And we'll move on to our next portion of the event, which is networking. We are now going to go into our second educational topic of the day sharing my screen here on sales planning. So I would like to introduce our facilitator for the day, Chris Fletcher. They are a current mentor of Innovation Guelph who will be taking us to sales planning. So Chris is an experienced sales leader having run sales organizations for many of the world's largest tech companies. Now a business founder, Chris helps organizations grow their revenues and optimize their sales processes through her consulting and training practice. Chris is skilled in sales, management, sales enablement, business analytics, and business development. She has been working with the Rise Ventures program for three years. Chris earned a master's degree from Warwick Business School and is a certified master coach. So I'll pop my share here. Take it away, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Carly. Always get embarrassed actually when <laughs> read my bio out like that. Um, it's lovely to meet you all. Uh, so I am going to share my screen here. Ooh, one second. Wait, hold on. Can you see that okay? Can you see my PowerPoint okay? Okay, the right slide, yep. Fantastic. So um 
So as Carly mentioned, I've been in sales, sales management for a long time now, um, work with uh, small businesses, um, as well as, you know, as part of larger organizations, and uh, primarily over the last seven years, advising and coaching on how to sell more effectively. And, uh, and ultimately, hopefully this will might change a little bit of some of your ideas and hopefully give you some new ideas about how you might be able to be more effective in your sales planning and the way that you think about your, your sales and your developing your sales best practices. So there's a, I like to keep my sessions open and flexible. So if you hear me talk about something and you want to stop me, please do so. Um, I've, I've probably seen it all before, <laughs> seen it all before. So i um, happy to share, you know, any comments or experience. And we'd love to hear from you all as we go here. So. Um, so a couple of things I'm going to touch on today, um, and again, we can use the chat or, or, you know, just kind of put your hand up and stop me as we go so we can keep it interactive. I'm going to talk about sales planning, um, and I know Shannon was talking a bit about kind of your customer journey. Um, I gave you a little bit of homework around the buyer journey, and these things start to fit together. So um, I'm going to address a little bit around like how you can think about these fitting together so that you can execute on, from a sales strategy that is absolutely coordinated with your marketing strategy. And then there's a number of things around sales process. Um, and again, I can go deeper or not so deep, depending on your feedback to some of the questions and the polls that we'll go through here. So don't hesitate if anything is confusing or you want me to delve in in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the sales plan. Um, so a lot of organizations, and we were just, um, Shannon was talking about kind of marketing planning, but a lot of organizations don't necessarily think about sales planning in the same way. So um, that is, is one thing that I would encourage you to think about if you have not started to develop a sales plan um, at this point, or if you have kind of a high level uh, kind of sales strategy that you would like to execute upon, maybe you haven't necessarily put an actual plan together about what you're intending to do from a sales um, standpoint. So, um, so there's a there's a few things that are standard to uh, planning. Planning in general absolutely applies to sales planning. Um, of course, defining your objective. I'm going to talk a bit more about this as we get into the sales process as well. But overall, you want to be as realistic as you can be. You want to, of course, set, um, set reasonable goals, but ultimately it's, it's setting those goals and measuring against those goals clearly that is going to enable you, just like with any planning, to be able to pivot your messaging, pivot your style of outreach. Maybe it's your the people that you're talking to. So there's so I actually have a template for this that um, I can share with you if anyone is interested. Um, but thinking about kind of where you are now, kind of planning one on one, uh, who you are selling to, what that message is, and testing whether that message is actually converting into sales is really important. And we're going to talk a little bit about the type of message and how that differs um, also to a potential marketing message that you may have already developed. Uh, Rebecca, I will send you, I will send you actually over the template, no problem. So, um, so as you, as you start to plan, e even if you haven't necessarily put um, a kind of a formal structure around what your success metrics are going to be yet, going to talk more about those in a bit of detail and it will depend on where you are and how you are approaching your market 
I'm aware that uh, some of you are B2C, some of you are B2B. So there are different flavors of that approach of what you want to measure. Um, but ultimately, there are a number of key performance indicators that we're going to talk about um, through this process that will apply to, to each of your organizations um, so that you can keep a measure of your success. So short-term goals are important, um, particularly as you're trying to break into a new market or if you have a new product. You know, when you're leveraging your marketing plan and you are kind of developing that awareness, say early on, you absolutely want to test out um, a number of ways to engage people to take them from that awareness into taking action. And that's the biggest thing to from a sales messaging standpoint is that action. Without that action, you're driving awareness which is great for marketing. It's great for exposure. People become more familiar, but it's the action that ultimately drives to that conversion and into that sales and revenue that you're looking for. So um, for um, this is part of what uh, I teach as part of the Rise Ventures. Uh, I think many of you will have touched on this before as you as you look back through your experiences of um, kind of developing a sales strategy, even if you actually haven't got a plan yet, um, for your products and services. Um, this is critical. This links this kind of concept of the jobs to be done. It links to your business model canvas that I'm sure all of you have put together. You take your, your market segment, your customers that you are targeting and your value proposition, and those together form the jobs to be done concept where a customer is hiring, if you will, in inverted commas, your product or service to do something for them. And you can think of this as what you're trying to uncover is the motivation. So why would they hire your service, your product to, uh, to do something for them? Maybe they want an experience. Maybe they're, uh, you know, they, they've got a hard problem that they're trying to solve. Maybe there's an opportunity that they maybe they want to improve themselves or they want to um, maybe they're looking at kind of different aspects of, um, you know, of developing their own business. So depending on your uh, your product or service, you're going to tune in to um, to a specific jobs to be done. So I thought I'd just highlight this quickly and maybe I'll just ask a quick question. Anyone familiar? with the toothpaste brand. We're going to talk about something quickly that we all know about, toothpaste. Anyone familiar with the brand called Hello? No one? No? Okay, okay. Okay, no worries. So, um. Uh, some of you might uh, might be might be familiar when you see um, when you see hello. It might resonate with you this story around how they started. Um, so hello is a tooth. Well, now actually part of a big conglomerate. They were a small startup that was founded. Um, based on kind of the, the the need of the developer of the of the family ultimately that were developing this solution to for cleaning tooth obviously teeth cleaning um, but they wanted to go at it from a natural standpoint so breaking into the the toothpaste market as you can imagine is a huge undertaking it's a multi billion dollar market of course it's dominated by your Unilever and Procter and Gamble. So how, as a small startup, um, could you break into that market? And so what the key to understanding and kind of breaking into a market is, is, of course, converting that awareness and idea into this action. And what they did is they, they didn't talk about 
things like kind of standard things that you'll hear like um like here on the Colgate you can you they Colgate are talking about you know stronger T's they've got whitening um what you actually see you know across all of the different um toothpaste vendors is that they have a similar kind of talk, similar kind of talk track, right? They're going to prevent your cavities. You can use this one for whitening. They're asking you to select based on your preferences. But what the Hello team realized is if they went about it the same way, um, they would struggle to get the attention in such a big market. But ultimately, they only needed a tiny piece of the market to be extraordinarily successful. So if they went about saying, hey, our, our uh, toothpaste is, um, you know, is all natural, um, it absolutely does, you know, clean your teeth, it absolutely does, you know, pre help prevent cavities, they're going to get lost in that same world. And so they won't be able to establish a following. So it, it isn't that they wouldn't be necessarily successful, but they wouldn't be wildly successful. Um, so what they tuned into was the fact, again, from a personal standpoint, what is motivating someone to buy their toothpaste? And you may not be able to tell from here, but actually this toothpaste is, um, you can see it on the bottom there, uh, what they call blue raspberry. So it is a raspberry flavored toothpaste. and they now have a chocolate one. They have all kinds, actually, have body scrubs, all kinds of things. Um, and what they, what they were basically saying is not only is it, you know, healthy, healthier for you, um, they're choosing different flavors because the job that they were struggling with personally was that they had small kids and they wanted to get them to clean their teeth on a regular basis. So the motivation behind people to take action, they were targeting that motivation, which is if you have small children, if you are aunts and uncles, if you are grandparents and so forth of small children, and you are having a hard time getting them to clean their teeth on a regular basis, then you should try Hello. So they were wildly successful. Um, I just love the kind of the simplicity of the story. Um, and of course, you can imagine that, you know, if, if any of you have small children or you, your grandparents and you have small children, they don't like the mint flavor. They don't want to clean their teeth necessarily, but you know it's healthy for them. And so they're really tuning in to a piece of the market with a message that drives action. Any any comments on that? Um, it's fascinating because I was just reading a, uh, a few articles about this approach of um, and you know, excuse my marketing lingo here, but uh, you know, you can look at segmentation and you can figure out that your purchasers are women in their uh, late 20s uh, that make this much money, et cetera, et cetera, sell them a toothpaste. And, and that fits anybody and has absolutely no value except to give you uh, some demographic that you cannot use in any way, shape or form. But when you okay. focus on the problem you are trying to solve and you focus your messaging on the problem, Kids don't like to brush their teeth. Finally, you have something that resonates. You can, you can, you can, you can, um, you have a, a very clear uh, value proposition and uh, you are going to be wildly successful if you focus <laughs> not on the demographic, but the problem that you are trying to solve. So in a sense, it is value proposition one one. Yeah, for sure. Other, other comments? There is a question in the chat, Christine. Uh, Sandra uh, says, so basically they have to do a job no one else is doing as well? Um, yeah, I mean, basically they are, they are defining that job. And of course, in this case, based on personal experience, but each of you have an understanding, you know, for your organizations, what are the motivating factors 
behind why someone you know would hire you hire your product or service to do a job and really what you're doing is you're putting yourself into your into your customer's shoes instead of talking about what you do you're talking about them so you're trying to align to them and so you know, the more unique that you can make that but but using the language of the people that you're targeting so we don't we want to use the language because we're trying to align we're trying to build that connection that gets them to take action so you don't have to be you don't have to be in a blue ocean situation for example where there's no one else um you know that you're competing with but if you can tailor your value proposition Again, from a, a sales standpoint, sales sales is measured by the action that customers take. Yeah, awesome. Great, Kevin, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I, I again, the example is a good one because it's a, it's a common challenge that companies have is being able to differentiate themselves in a marketplace that often is very crowded. Um, what I see here is kind of like something where, like, you know, rather than somebody say, oh, I've got a line of toothpaste, oh, that's nice, you know, kind of, so what type of thing, versus, oh, I've got this line of toothpaste, and you're presenting it in a different way, or there's just something that, and they go, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. My question is, how do you get over the, oh, wow, that's pretty cool, and the newness? Because when this company is kind of operating a year from now, they're going to have gotten over that message, so to speak. People are going to know they exist. And um, I, I don't know if that, if that makes sense, my question. Yeah, I think so. So what so what what starts to happen is that you start it starts word. of. I mean, in this particular market, it's, it's about word of mouth and people start to recognize the brand they bought out a chocolate one which was even more popular as you could imagine with kids than the raspberry one and so people started to share you know that this what this was one of the things that they were leveraging and next thing you know the whole family you know whole families were buying because the kids at least would stop complaining and would clean their teeth so they they stuck to that because that is um that's a never ending need that parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles and so forth are going to have and so they they kept that they kept that going and um and so people were sharing they they grew astronomically and and very quickly they now they, they you will still see the hello brand i think it was png who bought them out but they were bought out for an awful lot of money about five years later. Um, so they 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 were threatening the big guys by not talking about the features and functions, by making it kind of an experience, if you will, a nice experience to clean your teeth. And they completely differentiated themselves in the market. So I think to start with, you know, it was you know, they, it's, they made that connection with people who had this problem. And then once they had that connection, they kept that going. And then they, you know, added the extra flavors. They now have like body scrubs. So they have a chocolate body scrub and a raspberry body scrub. Um, so, so they began to develop then this following, which kept them that unique space in the market. So they weren't a they weren't a kind of a, a one trick pony, if you will. Yeah, so so they were in the kind of a constant state of innovation, like they were constantly, you know, kind of building on their building on their core momentum, right, and just keeping that interest going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen it just just you know, like I've seen it where I've seen you know companies, let's say in the food industry who come in and they have an organic or some sort of, you know, really good approach to marketing their phone or selling their food product. And it's different, right? It's like, oh, wow, this is great. And then they go into stores and shops and then, you know, they're in there for six months and, and the grocery stores in these places, a lot of times 
they want to see that, okay, is the product moving right? Yeah. So, and those are the things that kind of are metrics that kind of go behind the scenes. So I'm just curious because because then sometimes companies go back a year later and then they're still trying to kind of get repeat sales and they're struggling with that part of it. And kind of yeah. the oh wow factor has gone away. Number one, because it's highly competitive. Uh, number two, it's just like so. I'm just I'm just curious, like because because this is a great story. It definitely is, you know, because this is one of those markets that is highly um, commoditized, if you will. So yeah. anyway, I think what 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 I see happen when um, when a product is developed, and um, I, I think. Um, when you get like it's a tendency to get sucked into more of the commoditized messaging because that's what as you could see like everyone in this market talks about you know reducing your cavities and, and you know teeth whitening and so forth so that so that's they're all features of the different types of toothpaste so I see when people lose track of what that job to be done is that they are here to do or their service is here to deliver, um, that's when things start to go awry. Because then the then the consumers or the consumers of your product or service cannot distinguish between when they should leverage one product versus another product. And it's it's that uniqueness that if you really if you can really hone in on that customer circumstance. Um, and taught their language, no matter what that product is, whether it's a, you know, a product like toothpaste like this or uh, anything in a B2C, as well as B2B, like it's very common in a B2B environment that people talk about the, the product features, what it is and how it works. And they forget that people don't buy for that. You're trying to tap into that motivation. And that's why people buy. All right, thank you. It's awesome. Good questions. Thank you. Um, and again, I've got um, I've got an article that maybe Kali, if anyone's interested, I can send you that article that shows you how you can take your um, your um, business model canvas and take those two sections of the customer segments and the value proposition, and how you can develop that sales conversation so that you can drive action. So it builds on what you've already got. Okay, awesome. Okay, so, so we, I touched a bit there. I'm conscious that some of you are B2B, some of you are B2C. Um, I would say, you know, from a B2B standpoint, the jobs to be done absolutely is the case. Still the same principles apply to differentiate yourself in the market. Um, what you'll see from a B2B standpoint are that you're going to break that down by the different personas or the different roles that you're that you are going to be targeting for that traction. So think of there are different people, typically more people involved in a B2B selling situation. So that's why I've got these little ball hats here. So different personas. The different personas have a different set of jobs to be done. So for those of you that are B2B versus B2C, the challenge here is um, not talking about somebody else's job to be done to the, to the wrong role. Um, again, being clear about what that job to be done is for those people you you are driving those outcomes um for them in their mind that's what is going to make them take action to employ your product or service okay so i have a little poll here um just wanted to get a flavor from you how your sales messaging, does it differ like this from your marketing message to this point?
Any more thoughts down here? Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So I think most of you are saying that they, the, that your sales and marketing messaging doesn't differ, which is, which is awesome. You want to be consistent. Um, hopefully this gives you some ideas um, of how you can test out different messaging again, to drive that action. And again, if you, if you haven't necessarily thought about it this way, the difference between sales and marketing messaging, um, some of the assets that uh, I'll send you as a follow-up to this um, will help you with that too. Okay. Let's, uh, let's keep going. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the buyer journey. Um, just give me a quick show of hands who had an opportunity to listen to the short video. No? Okay, okay, okay. Well, um, it doesn't look like most of you had a chance to. Um, I, I won't play it for you now um you have the link here it, it's in your pre-read as well um I'll talk a little bit about it this is again kind of you think about what you are trying to achieve at different points with a buyer so thinking about whether it's you that is in that seller role as an individual, whether you start to develop a sales team or you might hire, you know, um, an SDR or somebody to help you sell, understanding where your key buyers are in their process, um, again, is one of the one of the keys to that conversion. So we talked a bit about the messaging, like how you message for people to take action. Um, but the, the biggest challenge here is, and, and you can see this kind of from, from this graphic here in the video, is you can think about kind of three stages um, that your buyers, and I'm specifically talking about your buyers here. So if you're in a B2B organization and you're selling B2B technology or services, um, we're talking about the buyer. So you're going to have probably other people who are influencers and so forth. Maybe they are responsible for doing, um, you know, doing homework and so forth on the market of what could be available. But here, you, what you're trying to understand is the person who can say yes, but more importantly, the person who can say no, like where they are in this buying journey. So a common one um, kind of around this first area here is to un uncovering that problem or opportunity. So this is that action. So this is what the job to be done kind of exercise is helping you do. And it you basically as the seller, whether that's you as an individual, you're messaging, you're trying to illuminate that problem that challenge, that job to be done so that they will do something about it. So it isn't sufficient to say, um, oh, I sympathize that you have this kind of problem. You basically want to, kind of the thought process from a selling standpoint is illumination is all about, hey, you've, you've got a problem. Others in your space have this kind of problem. If you have this kind of problem, then um, actually it's chances are it's a bigger issue than you think it is. And you're trying to lead them, like lead that mindset to, oh, like I didn't realize it was, you know, that big a problem, right? Could it have that big an issue on me, whether it's from a B2C standpoint personally, or if you're selling B2B, you know, again, there will be personal drivers as well as professional business drivers. So you're trying to illuminate. So you're not just trying to say, hey, you have a problem. 
that's kind of unfortunate. I've got a solution to that problem. You're trying to illuminate so that they take that action. And that's what that, that job to be done, that's kind of the overarching um, reason that you want to be thinking that way. But the, co the common challenge, though, is we then um, kind of sometimes we forget about that illumination and we go straight to, hey, did you know that? And which is teaching. So I'm going to um, I'm going to teach someone. I'm going to educate them that if you use this product or service, um, you know, these kinds of things are, are good for you. You know, the nutritional value of this is great. Or if you use this kind of service, you're going to, you know, like mitigate some kind of risk down the road. So lots of salespeople, the danger is that you go straight into that education kind of mode. And you can think about that. I think about that when I go to um, go to the farmer's market, for example, and I see maybe I see a new honey or something like that. And they go straight into, oh, well, you know, let me tell you all about it. And they again, this, they might, might start talking about the features, but they go straight into that learning mode, like they're educating me about the honey. But they have not established whether I think I have a problem that that honey, for example, would solve for me. Um, and so that that's that's kind of one of the things I would caution you on um, as you are engaging in these kind of conversations, however you are engaging, is to think about where the person that you're talking to, and most importantly, are they the buyer or are they the influencer? And if you can get to the buyer, and maybe they are one and the same person, depending on your product, have you uncovered that problem? Have you kind of made that light bulb go off to, oh, I think I have a problem before you went to educate? So that's my my question to all of you to think about that. We often go straight to educate. And then what happens if you go straight to educate, you then ask people to make a choice. Hey, that seemed, you know, like, would you buy, would you buy some, would you buy some honey? And, um, and, you know, from a sales standpoint, we think about, oh, people are pitching me and I might feel under pressure. And that is when you see people pull back and say, well, actually, maybe I should talk to my spouse about that before I make that decision. Or in a B2B, oh, well, I probably need to you know, involve some other people. I'm not sure if this is the right kind of solution for us. So if you've experienced that, and, and honestly, we all have kind of in our sales development kind of journey, if you experience that kind of push the brakes, way, 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 you know, I, I'm not sure, la, 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 la. Chances are you haven't illuminated that problem before going in to educate. Any comments or thoughts on that? Have you seen that in your sales interactions to this point? Yeah, I see some heads nodding. Yeah. It happens because we're all so enthusiastic. We've got all this knowledge, which is awesome. You do need that and people will be ready to hear that. It's more about the timing. So just don't jump straight to that. Any questions? I'll leave you with the video. You have the link. So he's a fun guy actually on the video. So um, absolutely take a moment if you can to, to watch that. Okay. So again, we talked about the kind of buyer. So buyer journey, those stages, right? Uncover, learn, choose, and ultimately purchase. So those those three are the same stages, uncover, learn, choose that we were just talking about. But we represent it as a straight line, of course, but we know that as people, we're a lot more complex than that. 
And this is an example. Um, this actually comes from Gartner from a B2, B2B example of how many decisions are being made. So obviously not all of you are B2B, but it's a complex buying journey for your buyers as well as you. So chances are they haven't bought something like this before. Again, depending on your product or service, particularly if you're selling for B2B, you're probably dealing with people who have not bought a service like yours before. They may not know the pros, their own process internally of how to buy that. So trying to understand that and understand where they are. Again, just use your, you know, your own personality. You don't need to be kind of, um, you know, what, what some people think, hey, it's high pressure selling. You don't need to be that. Just It's having a conversation about what is required, particularly if you're in a B2B environment so that you can help them help themselves to take your recommendations forward. So um, again, you'll have a copy of these slides. Um, there's a number of things that kind of go into this. There are a number of buying tasks. Again, this is, this is you can think of this from a B2B standpoint, particularly from a consensus building. Um, in B2B, we see, I think it was between kind of seven and nine people involved in a decision-making process. Now it's like, I think it's like 12 to 15 people involved. And if you think about then the economic pressures, they're like all of us are thinking about like, you know, the choices of where we're going to spend that money, whether that's us personally from a B2C standpoint or from a corporation B2B. So there's, there's going to be much more scrutiny on like, where am I going to spend, you know, the limited funds that I have? So again, that's what we're trying to understand here. Um, so that if we've done that kind of uncover that illumination, we teach them, we lead them through to close, know that they've got a lot of things going on in the background too. So the best salespeople help their end buyer kind of through their process. And so that's that's what I would like you again to be thinking about. And in, for those of you that have sales teams or are thinking of hiring sales teams, um, the, these are the different kind of processes that help you to help your sales team to execute more effectively on your behalf. But this buyer experience in the middle here, like this is about the kind of the psychology, right? So if you think about what we were talking about, the uncover and learn, right? It's like, okay, do I have a problem, that illumination? And it's like, okay, I have a problem, but is it really worth changing? Like is, you know, maybe this is going to be more expensive. You know, is it is it worth changing? Maybe it's maybe it's cheaper and you still might see hesitation. So. So one of the reasons for that is that they haven't determined if it's really worth saving. Maybe maybe the change, um, not from a cost perspective, but from a process perspective, from a personal perspective is what what would stop them. But from a buyer, like thinking about it from a buyer's perspective, when you think about the way that you're marketing, the way that you're trying to interact for people to take action, getting them over that hurdle of, is it actually worth doing anything? Is it worth changing the way I approach this or I think about this right now? Um, it's probably the most important thing because as you can imagine, that's the piece that leads to action. And then as you go through here, there may well be other solutions, but if you have targeted again with that jobs to be done in that illumination, you're setting yourself up as the, the leader in this space, right? As the advisor in this space, um, someone that is looking at you know, their problem or their situation from a unique standpoint that is, is about adding value to their life, whether it's a personal B2C or to their business, to their professional life, if it's B2B. Let's check with another question here. Is there a difference in the sales approach in person versus over the phone? So, 
Um, there is no difference in the in these stages. I would say the only thing that dif that differs potentially is the speed that your buyer moves through these stages. Okay, so again, depending on your product or service, be clear about what you are trying to, um, what you're trying to do if you're trying to help them uncover like that illumination. If that's your first outreach, then that should be your objective. You're trying to get some kind of alignment to be adding value to illuminate that problem. So if you're doing that and, um, Again, depending on your product or service, you can have that conversation over the phone. You might go through this process with your potential buyer very quickly. It might be one conversation. It might be multiple conversations. Um, so chances are it's speed that changes, not what, uh, not the kind of the bits that they move through, if that makes sense. Awesome. There was another uh, question in the chat there, Chris. I'll just read up from okay. Allison. How do you recommend an email campaign with cold leads in the same industry as you? Um, in the same industry as you. Uh, Allison, can you clarify that just a little bit? What do you mean? In the energy industry. Okay. So, so from an email campaign standpoint, I would say that your initial outreach, whether that's email, um, again, you, you might be using you know, LinkedIn, for example, in a B2B environment, think about that illumination. And it comes back to the job to be done of the people, the roles, so targeting the right role, I'm talking in a way that they expect and then illuminating that problem for them to drive action. Um, and you can do that, obviously, with lots of different techniques. Um, so you might have a white paper, you might have webinars and so forth if you're B2B. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can approach that illumination. Um, but ultimately, those cold outreaches, they work when you can illuminate the problem and help them realize that that problem is worth solving, it is worth changing. I'm not sure though, Alison, if I understand enough about your space. I don't know if you wanna come off mute and share a little bit more. Maybe I can help a little bit further. Okay. Okay, she says she's got it. Okay. Okay, so let's keep let's keep going here. I'm conscious of the I'm conscious of the time. Um, so again, stop me if there are any questions. Um, good questions so far. So thanks for participating. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about kind of what that sales process might look like. <laughs> now, this is kind of a, a fun graphic. This is, um, I was working with a, a company that is selling to um, obviously B2B, in this case, selling to a chemical company. And they say, hey, you know, like somebody came to a webinar, um, you know, that sound, that looks interesting. Then you're kind of like, oh, as you can see, you're like all over the place. Someone else gets involved. It's like, oh, wow, like this is really cool. And then it's like, oh, no, you know, they've gone quiet for a bit or, oh, we need to get another team involved. And like there's a whole like there's like a spaghetti of activity. And this is this is common. Right. I mean, obviously, we're complex human beings, but this is common, whether you're B2B or B2C. So what you're trying to do with the sales process is, again, we talked a bit about leading that buyer through a process so that you can 
like they're going to get frustrated when they start kind of pickling, you know, wiggling around through a process like this, you know, they're going to have their ups and downs. Even if you have someone who's excited by your service or technology you're offering, um, they'll get frustrated with their own organization if they're in a B2B environment um, because they can't make something happen. So the, the idea behind the sales process is to help you engage with them and lead them through the process so that you don't miss anything. Now, of course, every customer is going to be different. We're all coming from a different standpoint. But if you can be using a structure, it will help you to avoid kind of some of the some of the gaps and it will help you lead more of your potential prospects, you know, through to converting them into into a customer. So that's the that's the objective. So um, I wondered whether you know, question for you or like, could you share any examples of a buyer behavior that you've seen that's gone? kind of higgledy-piggledy like that, that didn't convert in the way that, um, that you had hoped or you expected. Anyone would share? You haven't had any challenging customers? <laughs> I'm sure I could uh, help you out with that. <laughs> no? Okay. No one's prepared to share. I've experienced lots of challenging <laughs> customers over my time. I'm probably a challenging customer myself sometimes. Um, and that's what starts to happen when you learn a bit more about the sales process. You start to see... Um, you know, how people don't kind of illuminate that problem for you before, you know, you start, um, they start getting into, um, hey, you know, let me tell you about my product or solution. So as, as you can imagine, from from my perspective, I get a lot like from um, maybe technology companies who are trying to sell, you know, an enablement platform, and they go straight into, oh, I see that you're in this sector. And hey, I've got a tool that does this. I don't really you didn't illuminate my problem at all. Kevin, you, you have your hand up. All right, I'll add one. I have to kind of go back into my little data banks because it's uh, <laughs> been a while since I've done some of this. But, uh, but I had a client some time ago and I was doing some work and we were, we were trying to set them up with a business partner. And this partner was from Europe. And... Um, and we were we had done a presentation. They'd been very interested in the product. We did sort of a webinar. We started to kind of go through that all that dialogue, and we even got to the point where we had shipped a product to them to take a look at and kind of review and kind of go through it. And then something kind of happened, just kind of in between the stages. And as I started to kind of follow up, I, I got some very direct questions, and the direct questions were. When can you get me a product? Like, when can you get me this in my hands to my for my customer? And I I had to kind of explain, well, you know, the clients in Europe and they're just kind of waiting, you know, and it was and it was almost like it was um it was just uh it was just kind of like that wasn't the answer this person wanted to hear. Yeah. And so after that, just kind of like follow up really just didn't happen. It was almost like you got email your call kind of get ghosted a little bit right so yeah i don't know so those are kind of things where you've gone through the whole process you go wow this is a great lead it's a great opportunity it can result in x amount of dollars or whatever it is but uh but then you go through that phase where either it's something critical but you can't quite overcome the objection or what have you and i never resolved that one like it was just something that you just have to let it go eventually yeah yeah, no, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Sorry, you had that experience. It happens to us all. I would say it happens to us all. Um, and those are the kinds of things. Again, it's it's complex. Selling is complex. It's not easy. So we're never going to necessarily avoid all of those. What you want to be able to do is is to put a bit of structure around it. 
so that you, you're less likely to have those situations. Or if you do, if you have that situation where someone all of a sudden kind of looks like they're, you know, they're, they're completely going in a different direction, you actually are able to capture the why, right? Yeah. So we're not, we're not going to win all of the deals, all the opportunities, all those interactions. It's, it's just not going to happen. But the best thing that you can do by using a sales process is that you can capture what has happened and then you can make a more informed decision as to why kind of something went wrong. And, and you can come back to, you know, maybe they maybe at that time, that particular type of customer wasn't the best fit for your product or service, as an example. Yeah, I, so I, I'll, add, I'll add something to that because I kind of have seen over the years what I feel is sometimes when you talk to people that are buyers, right, that are target prospects, they get approached by a lot of people, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of times, you know, these are buyers and they kind of, you know, and they have very open doors. Yes, I'll take a look at the information, you know, because they're curious and sometimes it's competitive. Maybe they're using other products or whatever it is. And so they kind of gather. So it's like, I think what I've kind of been more mindful of is the fact that I need to, um, I need to just kind of, you know, kind of um, do my own testing as to what information I give as I move through the cycle. Like it's rather than giving them a full product spec, here's what we're doing, blah, 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 blah give them more of a teaser and say, you know, well, what, if you'd like to have a presentation, or, or a meeting, you know, I can introduce you to state, you know, some of the people that will kind of go through and, and can explain it a little bit more. So I don't know if that makes sense. Cause I find that I think buyers that I've talked to have their own understanding of how to deal with sales. And many times you get better discounts and prices and <laughs> they'll do everything that they can kind of a negotiating standpoint, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, you're hundred percent right there, Kevin. The more you can lead them through the process, cause I mean, they might have been burnt again, like lots of us have been through different buying processes. Um, they might have been burnt by someone that they, you know, they believed that they could go through the process and like the product would be great, or you know, maybe they didn't live up to their promises. So we're all carrying all kinds of baggage, right? And you obviously don't know until you engage with them. But the more that you can do that is just to think about I don't need to deliver everything in that first conversation. What am I what am I trying to do? If I think about I'm going to break this up into stages, the only thing that changes is speed, remember. So just don't go straight to that learning, right? That education. I gotta educate you on everything because you don't. If we if we if you think about what the objectives are, break it up into small stages, you might go through the first two stages, for example, you know, quite quickly, maybe in one conversation, if they get excited and you get some more information. And now you can uncover the reasons that basically you would be a good fit for them and they would be a good fit for your product or service. So that's what a sales process absolutely helps you do. And then and then you can start tuning it, right? Then you can start saying, okay, with with these kind of people, the people in this kind of role this is working really well. So I want to keep doing it. But when I engage or they engage somebody else, or if I engage, you know, someone in a different role, well, that, that doesn't work for them. So then you go back to your job to be done. Like, how do you illuminate them to take action? And if you've got that right, maybe you, maybe you test out. That's when you can test out a few different things. Once you've got one message there that leads to some kind of action, now you can think about how does that affect the, the process that you want to help them kind of lead them through. Thanks for sharing, Kevin. That's awesome. Go for it, Shannon. You have a question? I can't put my hand up, so. <laughs> um, yes, so... When you were talking about the B2B process and all of the different decision makers, um, <clears throat> a client came to mind when they were, um, so we were getting leads for them and they were trying to close them. Um, 
And one of the biggest hurdles they had was with procurement. Um, and I think like a huge learning on my client's part was really deeply understanding the procurement process from their client perspective. Now, some of them are slightly different, but the majority are, are, are pretty similar in that industry. Um, so would you say um, from a sales perspective, the salespeople really need to get educated on that or um, how, like who, who handles that education and how does a company go about that? Um, so yes, it's the salesperson's responsibility to lead that customer and, and I'll say customer as, and if it's B2B, it's going to be groups of people at that, at that customer site through that process. So Ideally, you want to have someone who's your, your main sponsor, a champion. So you develop a champion, and that's different to a coach. So a coach is someone who engages with you, that you can have, you know, build a good rapport. They see value in your product or service. Um, and that's great. They may be an influencer. But a champion is someone who actually has influence at the executive level. And that's the that's kind of one of the core capabilities that comes out of understanding a sales process. So you need to find this as a salesperson, they need to find a champion, not just a coach, a champion. And, and then it is the question of the champion at that particular customer um we know we're going to be successful like our product or service is, a, is an excellent fit you know we can address you know a number of the challenges that perhaps you've gone through you know like demos and capabilities and so forth and assessment um but help me understand as a salesperson they're saying to their end champion help me understand who else needs to be involved in this process and then who else who else needs to be like they can think of themselves like as that five-year-old, ask the five wise, like who else, who else, who else is involved in the process? And, um, you know, have you made a purchase like this before to the champion? And chances are they haven't. Um, they might not even know their own procurement process. It's it's very common if they haven't bought a product or service like yours, that they, they don't know their own processes and as you can imagine, procurement changes the processes as they go anyway. So, um, so you want to have someone who's got some, like, who's got some weight in the organization to help kind of figure that out. Who needs to be involved? Like, what are the objectives of procurement? Like, what are they trying to do? And again, if you've got a champion, they will give you insight into how to deal with procurement. Um, like a lot of procurement organizations will set percentage goals. So they will say, hey, if you can get, you know, 5% off, you know, every vendor that you bring on board, then they might get a bonus or something like that. Um, others have, you know, different goals from a procurement standpoint. You know, a, a lot of bigger organizations do want to develop more of a, um, you know, a value added partnership these days, because they realize that you can't necessarily like grind everyone into the ground on, you know, on cost. Um, so understanding that organization, but it's the salesperson's responsibility to help uncover, like, what is it going to take, not just to make this sale, but to make them successful with your product or service. Does that help? Awesome. Thank you. Thumbs up. Good stuff. Yes, absolutely, Kevin says, uh, and there can also be budget timelines. Yes, that you want to schedule. Again, you know, insights, if you can get a champion, um, even your coach might give you some of this insights, you know, again, depending on the size of budget that you're asking for and the process, um, if you're asking for big budget, 
then you know do, do they have it in this year's budget how do they budget is it you know month to month like bigger organizations of course they'll be doing their budget cycles once a year like in september if, if they've got their new year for january so understanding again it's understanding like what the buyer has to do and trying to help them through that process is a is a key sales activity And I would say the more that you can leave that, the more you leave it in the hands of kind of your end coach or your end champion, the, the, the less likely you're going to be able to predict when that revenue is going to close. Diane, have a question or a comment? Go for it. Yeah. Um, so we make chunky chili sauces. Um, so it's a product that is basically unheard of. Um, it's There's nothing like it in the marketplace. It's very difficult to find a positioning within the store for it. Um, we, but once we get it into people's mouths, it's it sells like if I approach a store, it's not too loud. I'd say I have 99% sales, like, like they will buy it, they buy it. Um, the next question is, where do we put it? So, because it's a chunky chili sauce, so it looks like a salsa, but it's a pickled salsa, so there's nothing really like it. And then people uh, through requests, we ended up with four levels of spice. So we, so they're hot sauces, but it's called a he. And so nobody knows what a he is. So we find that it's hard to get people to to purchase it, right? If they, they, they tend to go to what they're normally used to. We do lots of store demos, farmers markets and shows, uh, but he's not just a hot sauce or a sauce. You can cook with it, marinade, like there's so much you can do. It mixes, it makes the best guacamole. So it's like the thing of the education part is huge, um, but we've definitely found that putting it in so people's I mouths, know, like yeah, uh, like at a farmer's market, 80% like of people will buy it. But it's we have a hard time because it's kind of like an obscure product. People don't remember, oh, I'm gonna go back and buy it. I, you know, we the return customer is also an issue is an issue, right? So, but as I say, getting into stores, all I do is I ask for five minutes of the manager's time, let them try it, and the sale is done. It's just getting it. Mm -hmm. And with no marketing budget, it's very difficult. Right, right, for sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I would think about what, what occurs to me as you're talking there is that you are delivering an experience not you're not really sell you are selling of course your product but you are selling an experience and so trying to get people to associate your product to an experience to have is going to make it more memorable so if you think about think about the big guys like um like pepsico for example they use the jobs to be done uh, you will see, you know, think about, you know, their adverts like um, for birthday parties or for the Super Bowl, things like that. If you think about those adverts now in hindsight, they're actually saying, hey, if you if you're going to have a Super Bowl party, you need to have like all of our products. So you've got all of the PepsiCo drinks and the Lay's and the Doritos and whatever you're right. They're all the PepsiCo family. But they're saying for for anyone that's having a you know, Super Bowl party, or I don't know, you know, uh, uh, some Paddy's Day party or something like that. They've, they've, they're trying to basically say, if you're going to do that to be the best host you can be, you have to create an experience. And that, that experience associating your solution, your product to an experience is going to make it more memorable. And people are going to share that. Um, so I get it that there's tiny marketing budget that you can't really 
you know, kind of reach um, as many people that way. But the more that you can get, if you can get into the store or when you're talking, like if you get people to try it out in a store at the farmer's market, think about talking about it as part of an experience. And then you're going to find that people are going to associate what you do, the product that you deliver to that experience. And that experience is something that they want to repeat over and over. Rebecca, you had your hand up. Um, I did. Um, so this is a bit of a practical question, I guess, not totally sales related. So if I'm totally off base, just we can move on. But um, maybe it applies to some other founders. So founder who, you know, we were the do everything, you know, everybody does everything right. um, themselves initially, right? Sales, marketing, whatever, start startup, like the whole the whole gamut of pieces is the founder. Um, but we're now in a place where we are ready to hire somebody into specialized positions. So my background is not in either sales or marketing. And, and we run a, I run a social enterprise. I founded a social enterprise that's a franchise. So um, I guess my question is a little bit specific to maybe yourself and Shannon of like, is this a one and then the other hire a salesperson and then a marketing person or a marketing person, and then a salesperson? Can you hire one person to do sales and marketing? Um, and I did step off the call for five minutes, so I hope I didn't miss this type of question already if you already answered it. No, um, good question. I think equally difficult answer, it depends on your product service and your objective. Um, so if you have a marketing plan, I would say you need a sales plan. Do you have a sales plan and a marketing plan? Um, if you have both of those, it's going to give you clarity. Like you, you ultimately you need both, um, but you want to drive awareness if you have some marketing budget. But you have to be able to convert that into action to make the sale. And and as we all know, um, without without revenue, you you know you don't have a business. So there's always there's always going to be a balance and at different times you're going to want to you know enter a new market and drive awareness through different marketing campaigns and so forth um so you want to think about the different activities that you need to do now and that you can build on over time so if you think about your jobs to be done you may find again um Honestly, I haven't had a lot of success with outsourcing uh, sales teams. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, young, bright people who you can look for sales skills that maybe um, you know, might have a marketing degree, for example, that can do a bit of sales and marketing. Obviously, you need to provide them that guidance, like with these plans. You'll also need some kind of playbook for for them to follow from a sales standpoint because the more you leave it for them to create um those talk tracks they, they may be kind of more naturally like that but they are representing your brand so having a playbook that they can follow even if it's only part-time is going to be really important okay helpful thank you Awesome, good stuff. Any other comments, questions? I oh, know I'm swiftly running out of time, but it was a really good conversation. Um, so maybe I will keep going on a bit more detail if that's okay with you all. So you will have a copy of this. Um, I'm not gonna go this in, into too much more detail. We've talked about kind of those three phases. The one thing that when you look at this, what I want you to think about is think about the risk line here. For example, early on when you're engaging with potential customers and prospects, risk is low in their mind. So because they're inter they're saying, hey, I've got a need. Um, you're doing the illumination bit, right? So, oh, that need is kind of you know a bigger issue than I thought it was you're doing that kind of illumination the risk at the bottom is really low so it, the risk of choosing you you know going with your product or service 
um, the risk of what they will look like to their family or friends, to their peers, if it's B2B. So all of those things they're not thinking about early on. But when it comes to making a choice to go with your product solution, to go with a different competitor, and don't forget a competitor can still be that do nothing, right? Stay with what they're doing today. Risk is the highest factor. So we talked a little bit about kind of the buyers are going all over the place. Um, but the last thing in their mind is even, even when they love your product or service and they want it, there's always going to be that, oh, what, how, you know, can I really afford it? Like, how will I look to my family and friends if I go this way? Whether again, B2B or B2C, all the same kind of the kind of feelings and behaviors kind of coming through. So the one thing from a sales perspective is to know that that happens, which is why, as Rebecca, you were talking about there, we want to have a playbook for a sales rep because they won't necessarily know this, particularly if they haven't been in sales for a long time. You will lose deals if you get people through the process when you get to that last stage, if you haven't gathered some of that information to help them through that last hurdle of, I get it, that is a decision. It might be a big decision. It might be more of an emotional decision versus a, a cost decision. But there is risk in their mind, and that's the last thing that they have before making that choice. So I won't go through all of this. There's there's lots of things here. It aligns directly to kind of what we were talking about, kind of on those on those stages. I see there's another comment or question here. Okay, I can have a little bit more time. So thank you, <laughs> thank you, Carly. Um, so um, I wanted to introduce you to kind of how you think about the sales process. So remember that kind of higgledy-piggledy. I've got, you know, customers going, hey, this is great. Then I'm not sure what to do. Then I might try it out. Then I don't come back. And then I, oh, and then someone else appears. You know, we've got different players coming in and out. Because, again, it's not linear. We're going to represent it from a linear standpoint, but ultimately there are these different stages that people are going through. And as a seller, this goes back to the kind of concept of having a playbook. So even if you're the seller, having a playbook for you that's going to help you like lead someone through this process. Again, speed is the only thing really that changes. Um, it will help you to be more consistent in being able to execute from those people who say, I say, I call them suspects. Hey, you know, I like that kind of sounds interesting. How are you going to lead them through that process on a consistent basis? Because that ultimately having a consistent process for converting those leads into sales um, is the key to your success. So here, um, this one um, I use kind of from a, a B2C as well as a B2B standpoint. It's going to look different for each of you based on your on your product or service that you're offering. Um, but these are the kind of from suspect discovery qualifications, solution development and so forth. These are internal. These are for you to know internally what you're going to do to help move a buyer from one step to the other through the process. And again, the speed might change. They might spend longer in one area than in another area. But the, the, first, the first two there, kind of number one and number two, that's their, they match your illumination stage, right? You're trying to develop trust. You're trying to differentiate your value. So what are you doing to align with them to help them through that? And, and this is this is how you start to build out the playbook. So you can be more consistent. You can learn as you go, as you interact with different people in different roles and so forth. And you can tailor your message so it can be as effective as possible to those different roles. Maybe I'll pause there for a second. Any, any questions on that? So 
if if you haven't already um, and you're thinking about a CRM, your customer relationship management system, these steps should be in your customer relationship management system. And as you have an opportunity, as you open an opportunity, as you get your marketing uh, marketing leads that come in, um, you're you're going to have these steps um, and you're going to move or your salesperson is going to move that customer uh, through these sales steps. And as you as you hire someone, as you start to build a sales team and you, you want to make it consistent, and that's the that's the core here is we want consistency so that we can see whether things are working, not working, we can see if we need to do something else, if we if um, if certain customers get stuck in a certain process that you can't move them as quickly as others through your process. You know, these are the things that uh, having a sales process gives you visibility into so that you can take action and continue to build your business over time. Questions, comments? Make sense? Great, lots of nods. Awesome, good stuff. Okay. So again, you'll have um, you'll have a copy of this, um, and as I was just mentioning, you can kind of kind of think top to bottom here, kind of in that uncover, learn, choose, right from a marketing perspective. Think about the buyer experience. So, if you take away one thing from here, think that sales is um, some art, but it's absolutely some science. So there, there is absolutely art to it, but without some of these process pieces, you can't get enough of that data that enables you to pivot um, as things change in your environment. Um, so think about, you know, e economic changes, you know, maybe you start opening into a different market, could be geographical changes, um, you're targeting, you know, different areas of the business. So you want to be able to get this feedback so that you can continue to build on that and build on your successes over time. Okay. And I think this was my last bit. I know we're all about that time. Um, I have a question for all of you. How do you forecast your sales today? What are your challenges in forecasting your sales? Anyone up for sharing? I'll, I'll share. Okay. So... Currently, my accountant does it. Cop down. <laughs> um, he does the projections. Um, but the challenge is trying to. How do you know that you're not just guessing wildly as opposed to, you know, basing it on something tangible and um, not practical, but I guess realistic is the best word I can come up with at this point. Um, my accountant seems to know that, but I'm trying to figure out, well, how do you know this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, so it goes back to, um, I'm just going to go back here. It goes back to knowing where people are in this process. If you don't know where they are, then you're absolutely in danger of, kind of ah, winging it a little bit, honestly. Um, and you might put someone who's in maybe one of these early categories, you might think, well, hey, you know, th this is a really good opportunity and it absolutely is a good opportunity. It's just how long is it going to take them to get from that point to, to closure, right? To implementing, to buying, to, to seeing ultimately closing is about that they see the value of your product or service. 
right? Not we've just enough, that they bought it. We've seen enough data and uh, and you know analysis done on that data. You can establish probabilities for things to happen at various stages, and you can see the value of your pipeline at all times. So. Um, you know, Salesforce has that type of pipeline happening. I, I think Joanne uh, and Courtney have uh, uh, some more practical things. I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say. Um, can I just add one more thing? So that sounds like an immediate um, kind of analysis, but when you're talking about forecasts, you're talking about two, three years down the road. So again, how do you determine that as opposed to just guessing wildly? Yes. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a formula to that. Um, so one thing, so there are, um, there, the, you can look at your conversion rate. So um, I haven't got it in here, but um, I often look at sales velocity. So sales velocity takes into account a number of things. Um, all really important to understand and understand sales velocity from your standpoint. The first one it's linked to is the number of opportunities that you have. So that's the that's potential. So think about your marketing leads that come in. That is potential opportunities that you have. So it's a lever that you can pull when you think about how do I build my my sales pipeline. I could. I could focus on getting um, a thousand opportunities um, at you know a smaller dollar amount, or I could focus on getting higher quality opportunities at a higher dollar amount. So, so, the, so the the number and type of opportunities is important. So, I, I touched on the kind of, so the number of opportunities, the type of opportunities, the the selling price that you are going to make that sale at. So again, if I make, you know, a thousand versus a hundred, you know, is that better business? Is it better business? Am I more likely to convert those? And then like, cause that goes directly to your win rates. So you want to work the number of opportunities that come in, the price that I can sell them at and the percentage of my win rates, the close rate. And then the last part of it is how long does it take me? Right. So I might have, you know, a hundred opportunities at, I don't know, say a thousand dollars each. And I can take those opportunities and convert them. Maybe I can convert 30% of them that come in as a marketing qualified lead. I can convert 30% of them at a hundred dollars each. And then you might say, well, okay, that's not going to get me to my forecast. I have, a, I have a plan. I want to get to this amount of revenue. So again, is it realistic? How many more opportunities do you need to develop and at what selling price and what would your conversion be? So if you need more opportunities, but you drive up the, the average price that you want to sell it at, maybe you double the price, you might get that same revenue, you might get more revenue, but it might take you longer. You might not get the same conversions. If I'm saying I'm, I'm going to change my price from $100 um, to $200, your, your conversion rate might go down. The, these are the four things for you to look at when you look at, I, I'm here and I want to get to this amount of growth. And then you can see how realistic it is. So can I, like, do I have the time? Um, what level of, from a pricing perspective, do I need to sell my product or service at to get to that goal? But those, those are the four things that, that build that consistency and that visibility into your pipeline. Hopefully that helps. Yes, thank you. Awesome. You had your hand up there, Joanne. 
Oh, hi. Sorry. Yeah. Joanne and I are usually here together. It's, uh, I'm Courtney, but Joanne's oh, my mother. She's just out right now for a few minutes, but, um, for us, forecasting can be hard when you have a new customer and you're, you know, it's that new relationship and you can compare it to your others that are in a similar category, but then it's like, it's the building that new relationship. That's hard. Um, yeah. I find for forecasting. Cause like, once you build that relationship, and you know how they work and, you know, the communication is going really, really well, but it's new relationships that I find the forecasting is a little more difficult for us. It's really mm-hmm. learning to get to know them, seeing how they work um, and really tracking it really, really well. And then also going back to our marketing, that really helps us forecast actually is looking at return on investment on marketing to help forecast, like you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. And you can develop like your own set of questions, you know, across your sales process so that you can get to know the key aspects of your customers and prospects, you know, across time. So then, so that, and again, if you're going to hire, you know, salespeople or you're going to have someone part-time and so forth doing this for you, this is again, where the playbook comes in. Um, and and like you know, again, the dangers come that you've you know somehow they've missed um, some of the important steps ahead of time, and then you think that you know everything is going really well, and then <laughs> like the brakes go on, and 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 nothing happens, or they you know they ghost you and so forth, and then they say, well, hey, I'm not quite sure if I can justify that, and so you end up kind of whoop, like right back around and almost selling it over again. And when you see that, that's chances are we've missed some of those key steps kind of earlier in the process. So so sometimes you get the illusion that, hey, this is going really well. And, you know, it, you go faster through the process. But if you get those situations, you just this is where the sales process comes in. That It allows you to double check that you've got enough of those pieces to build confidence. And that's what that's what happens. You start building confidence with these data points. Because as you say, absolutely, like every customer, every situation is going to be unique, but you're going to start to refine what's important for you to be confident in making that forecast and being able to execute, you know, from that leads into revenue. Okay, one one last thing I'm going to leave with you is. If you are, so I've talked a bit about the pipeline, the sales team. So I'm not sure that most of you have a sales team. If you start to think about your own sales team, again, you'll have a copy of this. Um, You know, a lot of salespeople will say, hey, you know, if you're going to outsource it, for example, um, be careful about the goals and objectives that you set like a lot of people will say, I, you know, I can, you know, make a thousand calls for you and we get 10% conversion. That's all very well and good. But are there the type of conversions that you're looking for? All right. Again, if you if you start to document, even in uh, even in a high level, like your sales process, based on your experience, you're the best people to be able to put that into a document to say, okay, this is how we have best converted our customers to this point over time. Knowing that you can now give um, some of that key information and you can judge whether that salesperson or that, you know, outsource company is going to be the right company to convert for you. And it's really important. It's not all about the volume as we've talked about kind of through the process. So there are these three types of indicators that you can start looking at like the behavior, good behavior of salespeople early on delivers revenue down the road. Again, the timing of that is going to be different for each of you based on your industry and sector and so forth. But good, just like um, all all good things, good things in at the front end, give you good things out at the back end. And the way that you can look at that, the most important one, are having these kind of quality behavioral measures and being clear with your sales team or whoever you hire, like what good looks like for you to be successful. 
not just kind of taking, you know, again, lots of people say, I can do the volume, I can do the volume. It isn't necessarily that that's actually going to get you to your goal. So behavior from a salesperson standpoint is what you're looking for. And then there are leading and lagging indicators. So lagging indicators are things that have happened obviously in the in the past, right? So think about like your 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 revenue, uh, things like time to close. So that's the length of your sales cycle. Those are all like looking in the rear view mirror. So they're they're good, but if your if your time to close on customers is getting longer and longer that time is already obviously time that you've you've lost potentially. So lots of people make the mistake of looking at the lagging indicators and saying, oh, you know, my, my sales is going up, it's, you know, or my sales is stagnating, but they don't find that things are going wrong and until too, you know, not too late, hopefully not too late, but later than you, than you could have potentially seen so that you can do something about it. So behavioral, leading indicators, lagging indicators. You can look at your own, it doesn't have to be complicated, look at your own KPIs based on your experience so that as you begin to develop a sales team or you're giving guidance, um, you know what you're looking for and don't be afraid to hold, hold people to that. Shannon, you have a question. Yes, yeah, so... Um... I had a client that hired uh, outside sales uh, people, um, multiple people at different times. Um, and they had a real challenge because they didn't provide a base salary. They just um, provided um, a percentage of the sale once yeah. it had closed. And sometimes it was a bit of a long sales cycle. So that was um, for the people that they did hire, some of those people were working with multiple companies yeah. um, because, you know, like they have to make a living and support yeah. themselves. Um, would you say that that is a must when you're hiring an outside salesperson to give them some of a base salary to kind of make your company a priority for them um how would you handle that yeah I would say the challenge is that it's a really competitive market mm -hmm. the, like finding salespeople is really hard finding good salespeople is even harder um so uh, obviously in the, in the tech world like that's a lot of my yeah. client base like they they go in a heartbeat you know, and, and then if you think about, you know, sometimes like we want French language skills, for example, in Canada, um, or if you're spanning into other markets, you might want Spanish or German, for example, even harder to find people with those skills. Um, there are a number of places that you can find people, but they're looking for development opportunities. So um, I think it's, you know, to be clear about what your expectations are. Um, some kind of retainer, I, I think, would help if you can, but being clear about how many hours that they're going to do, you know, do the work for you. You want to make sure, again, back to the playbook, that you've got a playbook that they're using your CRM. Like you need this data to be able to evaluate. So you, you have to hold them accountable um, to the agreement that you have. So even if they're not, um, you know, that you don't have them on some kind of retainer, um, yes, if the sales cycle is longer, then you're going to you're gonna lose people because as you say, they obviously they want to make money. So again, if you know that, right, that gives you the opportunity to negotiate better and to make sure that you can, you know, keep the attention of people and you're tracking their engagement on your behalf over time. Great, thank you. Awesome. Good stuff. That's all I had. She says way over time. Apologies for that, but it was a really good conversation. Hopefully you have all taken something that will help you be better selves in the future.
Thank you so much, Chris, for taking us through that walkthrough. I really appreciated thinking about it from the buyer journey and the jobs to be done. And side note, I hope to use the phrase spaghetti of activity at some point this week because that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Loved it. So folks, as we wrap up for uh, the last couple of minutes, I just wanna put people into just one more breakout room just to have that networking opportunity. And then we'll wrap things up for four o'clock. So I'm just gonna share my screen here to give you- Hello, welcome back everyone. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining today, for joining me on this afternoon morning for four hours for educational sessions. So as you've heard throughout, we'll be sharing slides and resources that the facilitators had shared with you in an email after the event. We also have an evaluation link that Sarah will pop in the chat right now. You have a couple of seconds to fill it out after the call. We'll also have that evaluation link within the email of resources. So we really appreciate your feedback in the events that we offer. So thank you again to our facilitators, to NRC IRAP for funding the IRAP, uh, Rise Up program. And just want to give a shout out to people that are finishing the program this fiscal year and who have finished the program in the past. If there's ways that we can continue to support you, if you've got questions, Innovation Guelph is here to support. So once again, from Innovation Guelph and Sarah and I, thank you so much for joining our event today. We'll be in touch and I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening. Take care, everybody.